Hi, everyone. I'm David Aragona with the April 17th edition of Horses to Watch. On the episode this week, I'm going to take a look back at three races from Aqueduct last weekend. We had our first five-day week of racing at Aqueduct, and there are a couple turf races I want to discuss, as well as one dirt race. We'll begin with the race from last Wednesday. It was the fourth race, uh, claiming 30000 for non-winners of two lifetime fillies and mares, going a mile and a sixteenth, two turns on the Aqueduct turf course. And we can pick it up right from the start. I want to focus on the number nine horse, Dynamite Kid. Now, Right away, she breaks fine, and she's going to get into a pretty good position heading into the first turn, albeit a little wide. But as they bend into that clubhouse turn, you're going to see things start to go awry very quickly for this filly, because the horses in front of her, they take the turn a little bit wide, and she's just going to really run off with Junior Alvarado, who's on her. She just basically bolts going into this first turn, and you'll see it right here, as he doesn't make an attempt to get in behind horses, and she just keeps running straight, whereas the other horses start to make the turn, and she is going to head out way into the center of the track, losing many lengths of ground in doing so. It's really hard for horses to recover from doing this one time in a race, but you're going to see this is not the first time that she bolts during this race, and uh, somehow she's going to be able to overcome this uh, impossible trip. She gets back to join the field on the backstretch. She's still racing four wide. She's on a straightaway now, so that doesn't matter quite as much, but she's never able to get into a position where she's going to save ground on the turns, and maybe just as a precautionary measure, Junior Alvarado, who's on her, kept her wide just so she doesn't take it on other horses in case she did it again on the far turn, which she's going to try to do as they bend into the far turn here. Once again, you can see Junior Alvarado is riding her, her pretty gingerly. He's taking a hold of that left rein, trying to keep her from bolting again. She's trying to get out on him. He does a better job of keeping her uh, on a straight course this time, even though she did go a little bit wide. As they come to the stretch, though, it seems like she figures out what her task is because she starts to run, usually in these situations when riders start to ask horses like this, the drifting gets even worse, but that was not the case with Dynamite Kitten. And once they get into the straightaway in the lane, she's actually finishing off this race and still trying to win it. Uh, this was a remarkable performance from this filly who lost so much ground just looking at the trackist numbers, she ran 111 feet more than the winner of this race, the number one who saved ground the entire way. Just to kind of convert that into lengths, that's about 12 lengths worth of, worth of ground loss. So Dynamite Kitten would have won this race for fun if she had gotten a clean trip. And it's kind of remarkable that she ran as well as she did, uh, even at this cheap level. Uh, she was in for the $30,000 tag this time. I don't think we're going to see her in for that same tag next time, assuming that John Kimmel, her trainer, can get that drifting issue corrected. Moving on to a race on Thursday, this is another turf race, but it's a sprint uh, going six furlongs, an allowance race for horses that have not, uh, not won one race other than maiden claiming or starter, also with fillies and mares on the turf. And uh, we can pick this race up from the start. I'm focusing on another gray horse. This is the number six, Science Fiction. And you'll see that she breaks towards the back of the pack. She doesn't really stumble or anything. She just gets off about a half length slowly. And when the field's bunched together in these situations, she just wound up getting shuffled back uh, to last a uh, couple strides out of the gate. She She's typically a speed horse, and she's a horse that was making the transition from dirt to turf in this race. She had actually had a very successful winter racing on the main track, uh, winning, I believe, three different dirt sprints in wire-to-wire -wire fashion. She wasn't able to get that sort of trip here after that slow break, and Junior Alvarado, who's also on this gray filly, uh, does the right thing by trying to not rush up into the race, but it's also a difficult trip for her because she is very wide going around this far turn. She's in the three or four path all the way around the bend. You can see that she's very keen trying to move up, and Junior Alvarado is trying to prevent her from doing it too soon. She's lost all that ground by the time they get to the top of the stretch, but nevertheless, she puts in a decent closing move here and briefly gets into the lead at about the eighth pole before a horse who saved a ton of ground, the number one, is going to go rocketing by her in the late stages. Science fiction will fade to be off the board in this race, but all things considered, I thought she ran a sneaky good race here because she had that tough start, she got the kind of trip that she really isn't supposed to appreciate, and she still ran on well enough to only lose seven second by about a half length. So science fiction, even though she doesn't have a whole lot of prior turf form or turf pedigree, she really ran a good race on the turf here. And her trader, Rob Atris, is known for getting horses to maintain their good form. And she had been very good form for him prior to this race. So I think there are some doors open for this filly if she comes back in a similar spot on the turf next time out. We'll transition to the dirt for the final race that I want to talk about, which took place on Saturday. It was the feature race that day, the top flight stakes for fillies and mares going a mile and an eighth on the main track, two turns around the aqueduct oval. And uh, 
The number four, Frost Dan, is the horse I want to highlight in this race. And we can pick it up right from the start. I'm not going to show what happened before the start because Frost Dan is a filly that typically has a lot of gate issues. And she's been known to hold up starts for four or five minutes at times because she refuses to go into the gate at all. She just gives the assistant starters a world of trouble. Uh, but this, on this occasion, she went into the gate with almost no problem. They put her blindfold on and she just walked right in like uh, that was exactly what she wanted to do. Uh, she clearly had her mind on running this day because she came out of the gate with speed and she was really hard for her rider, Hector Diaz, to rein in going into this clubhouse turn. Uh, this is going a demanding nine for long distance and what you don't want to see a speed horse do going this trip is open up like this film is doing she's just basically running off on the on Hector Diaz and there's nothing he can do about it because she is a speed horse you don't want to overrate her you don't want to strangle her because that's going to cost even more energy so he just kind of drops his hands and lets her set these fractions uh speaking of the pace of this race looking at uh, the time form us pace figures which is a good measure of how fast uh, she actually ran on the front end relative to the final time you see that half go up in 47 four fifth seconds compared to the final time which went in 152 and change that was really fast and the time form us pace figures indicate that because every single fraction of this race was color-coded in red, indicating that this was a fast pace at every single split. Coming around the far turn, the field starts to catch up to Frosty Ann, and briefly it looks like they're just going to swallow her up because they have the momentum, and she's basically lost all her momentum as she's beginning to tire on the front end. But to Frosty Ann's credit, once Hector Diaz asks her for her best run and gets into her at the quarter pole, she really responds, and for a brief moment it looks like she might actually fend them off. She's going to get leg weary in the final eighth of a mile, understandably, but she's going to finish fourth in this race and lose by less than two lengths. The number two who wins another broad got a very good trip from Maddie Franco, saving ground around the far turn and coming through between horses. Uh, but I thought Frosty Ann arguably ran the best race in here. And looking at the time form US speed figures for this race, that illustrates that because we give horses credit for setting fast paces. The 115 time form US speed figure that she earned is actually one point higher than what the winner got. So Frosty Ann has been in very good form prior to this. And I think she maintained her form here even though she lost this race and finished off the board. Uh, she's a horse that probably will appreciate a return to one-turn mile in her next race. I think the two-turn mile in Nathan's a little bit far for her, and she's going to get that as we move to Belmont Park. So if she shows up in another New York bred stakes, or even maybe an open company stakes, given her current form, I think she's very dangerous off this performance. So hopefully we can get one of these horses to win back the next time that they show up and make a score with one of these. So thanks for listening this week, and I'll come back with three more replays next week. Thanks, guys.